Hi, I'm Mike Bellevue, and today we're back out at Doula's Den. And this week, I want to talk to you about a uh, Eastern Pennsylvania frontiersman named Edward Marshall and his feud with the Delaware Indians during the French and Indian War. But before we get into the feud itself, I'm going to take you to some deep background as to why it all happened. And that's because of something known as the infamous walking purchase. All right, before we start shooting the gun, I'm going to give you a very brief overview of who Edward Marshall was and, and why he's important. Uh, in 1737, the sons of William Penn defrauded the Delaware tribe out of a big chunk of land. And this became known as the walking purchase because they presented them with a, um, a phony deed uh, that that they claimed the Delawares had signed that said that they ceded over to them as much land as a man could walk in a day and a half. And then they proceeded to send some hardy woodsmen uh, to cover that ground in a day and a half and they basically ran, not walked. And Edward Marshall was the only one who made it for the full day and a half and ended up claiming a huge chunk of land uh, for the proprietors uh, to be able to sell the sons of William Penn and that really was a problem for the Delaware. Well the Delaware never forgot Edward Marshall's role in taking their land. Now he was just doing a job and it was really the Penn brothers who were to blame but they were in England and Edward Marshall was here. And after Braddock's defeat at the Battle of the Monongahela, Pennsylvania's backcountry was wide open to Indian attack and Edward Marshall's days of peace were over. In April of 1757, while Marshall was away on business, his farm was attacked and his wife was captured by the Delaware. Marshall was a couple of days behind, but he tracked them. He tracked them to the village and he waited on the outskirts watching to see if he could find his wife or if he could see any of the warriors who had captured her. After a couple of days, he saw one of the warriors who was in that party, and he could recognize him by his track. And Marshall was an exceptional frontiersman. We, we often think of the western Pennsylvania frontier as, as being kind of the real 18th century frontier. But the area of Pennsylvania that was actually settled at the time was a pretty shallow band that ran from Philadelphia to the city of York town of York, which had barely been founded then. It ran north to Carlisle, which is no great distance, maybe 30 miles. And it ran north from Philadelphia into Bucks County. And beyond that, it was all wilderness. And it was definitely Indian territory. And when the war started, the Indians began to raid fairly deeply into the English settled areas of the colony. And that's what happened with Marshall. His wife Elizabeth was taken away. And now he had one of the warriors who took her basically under his, uh, his observation. And that Indian went off into the woods to hunt and Marshall tracked him silently, saw where he was going, got ahead of him found a log we could crawl up to and there he waited. Marshall was carrying what we would call a Christian spring rifle which is kind of a transitional long rifle very heavily German influenced beautiful gun 58 caliber the original is in the Bucks County Historical Society I am lucky enough to have a bench copy of it uh, and those guns were revolutionizing the frontier because up until then, smoothbores had been it. And for most of the world, smoothbores were still it. But the German gunsmiths, German and Swiss gunsmiths, starting off at Christian Spring, but filtering throughout the German settled areas of Pennsylvania and then down the Great Wagon Road, were building rifles that were really revolutionizing the frontier giving frontiersmen much more range for their hunting and for their self-defense. 
and Marshall had a very fine rifle. And he eased it over the log in front of him and waited. And he saw the Delaware coming when he was 150 yards away. Marshall set the rear trigger, sighted, and fired. But Marshall's bad luck wasn't over, or I should say his family's bad luck wasn't over. Just a few months later, in August of 1757, his son was cornered out in a field. He was out of reach of his rifle, and he was shot down from the tree line by a party of Delaware, who scalped him, mutilated him, and then left. But all this time, Edward Marshall had been searching still for his wife Elizabeth. If she wasn't at Shemokin, she might have been in one of the other Delaware towns. He made his way through Delaware country, checking every village he could find, but he found nothing. And his, his search was abruptly called off in November. Because in November, a party of woodsmen found her remains just five miles from Marshall's house. And in with her remains were the remains of two unborn twin babies, Marshall's children. When Marshall was told that, something in him snapped. And I think we can all understand that. He didn't have to search for his wife anymore, but he was going to search for vengeance. He picked up his rifle, he left his farm behind, and for the next year, he would make his income from the scalp bounty that the colony of Pennsylvania was offering on Delaware and Shawnee Braves. When he was an old man, his grandchildren would often ask him about his exploits. And he was very reticent to talk about. I mean, what he would say is, if I met an Indian in the woods, I'd close one eye and I wouldn't see him again. So a lot of his exploits went unrecorded. But I have got three stories that are pretty reliably sourced. And I'm gonna share them with you just so you can have an idea of what forest warfare was like in the French and Indian War. So Edward Marshall was sheltered behind a massive chestnut tree. A Delaware Indian was just 30 yards away and he was similarly sheltered behind a tree. They were playing a game of cat and mouse, looking for any body part that might stick out that they could shoot and incapacitate their enemy. But no one would make a shot unless they knew it was going to be an incapacitating shot. Because as soon as you shot, your flintlock was empty. And at that point, your opponent was charging you with a knife or a tomahawk, and you were gonna be in for the fight of your life. So, Marshall and the Indian played their cat and mouse game. But the longer this game went on, the more dangerous it was for Marshall, because he was deep in Delaware territory. It was midwinter, the snow was beyond his knees, so there was no running away. So if help arrived for the Delaware, Marshall would be trapped. So he knew he had to do something to try to bring this to a close. So he drew the ramrod of his right and he put his hat on it and he reached around the left side of the tree and just let the hat appear briefly. Then he waited and he reached around the right side of the tree and a shot rang out and his hat flew away. At that point, Marshall knew that the Delaware would be charging him with tomahawk and knife, thinking he had wounded him. Marshall leapt out from behind the tree and shot the Indian in the chest just yards away. So right at the end of 1757, Edward Marshall took a new wife. And interestingly enough, her name was also Elizabeth. And her family also had a history with the Delaware because her family farm had been raided by a war party and her father and her brother had been taken captive. But she and Edward Marshall were married. Marshall had killed a lot of Indians during 1757, but he was done. He felt that he had avenged Elizabeth. He was ready to settle down with his new wife and just live his life. But the Delaware had another idea. And when he was out in the woods in July, he found himself being stalked by one of the Delaware. So he immediately took to a tree and so did the Delaware. And they played their game of cat and mouse for a couple of hours. And it was hot. And 
the Pennsylvania forest in July is exactly like the Amazon rainforest in Brazil. <laughs> it's hot and extremely humid and full of biting insects. And it was just an ordeal. And after a couple of hours, Marshall was fed up with it. And he had a plan. And, and this plan kind of reflects the earthiness of people in the 18th century. Because he yelled out to the Indian, he said, uh, Hey, I'm Edward Marshall. And the Indian said, I know you, Marshall. So Marshall said, listen. He said, I've got to take a pee. And the Indian laughed and said, go ahead, pee. <laughs> Marshall said, oh no. He said, I got a proposal to make, make it safe for us. He said, you've got to be uncomfortable too. He said, what I propose is that we each shoot our guns at a mark to empty them. He said, then we can pee in peace and then we can go back to trying to kill each other. And the Indian laughed and said, okay, you shoot first. Because he thought, if this white guy is crazy enough to empty his gun, well, that just means the Great Spirit loves me more because I'm going to go shoot him. And he never thought Marshall would do it, but Marshall surprised him and said, okay, I'll shoot first. They said, what's the mark? Well, the Indian said, that tree. Marshall says, which tree? I can't tell. Show me. So the Indian leaned out and said, that tree. Boom. Marshall shot right in the head. <laughs> all done. And that was his final Indian kill. So over that summer at Easton in Pennsylvania, uh, the colony and the army, British army, uh, assisted by some missionaries, negotiated a treaty with the Delaware and with the Shawnee that basically took them out of the French and Indian War. And that really allowed the Pennsylvania backcountry to heave a collective sigh of relief. Because some counties, like Perry County, had been almost emptied uh, of people. The frontier had been pushed back to Carlisle, pushed back to Lancaster. Um, so when the raid stopped, people could go back to their farms, start to build their lives back up, and it was a good thing. And it was a good thing for the Delaware, too, because they were basically having a famine because they had not been able to do much hunting. They hadn't been able to do much farming. They had been too busy fighting all the time. And their people were starting to starve. So that was a much-needed break. It made the French very unhappy, and, and ultimately it made it quite easy uh, to attack Fort Duquesne. And, and that was a combination of the Delaware and Shawnee withdrawing their support and of the British taking Fort Niagara, uh, which cut off the supplies for Fort Duquesne. So, anyway, Pennsylvania got peace several years before the war was over, and Edward Marshall was able to go back to living his life. But Edward Marshall lived a good long life. He died in 1789. He been born probably in 1710. There's a little bit of doubt uh, about his age. His parents were Quakers, uh, though like a lot of people of that era, Marshall himself became anything but a Quaker, but uh, kind of like another famous Quaker, Daniel Boone. Like I said, he had a lot of close calls with Delaware warriors, and that's the story of Edward Marshall and his feud with the Delaware. So I hope you found it interesting, and uh, if you did, Give this a big old thumbs up and come on back next week and I'll have something else for you. Until then, bye.